Um, you know, they, my take is, is that the atomic unit of emergency medicine practice is the binary decision. You know, a go left, go right decision. And there might be 47 things that are, that, that are in play in terms of that decision, decision and multiple stakeholders and the like. And yet, at the end of the day, you have to be, you have to be admitted or discharged. There's no intermediate state, and so that, uh, so they have to do that. And, and you either have to, you know, kind of put a needle in that quivering five-year-old's <laughs> antecubital vein, or, uh, or not. And, and that decision matters to the five-year-old. You have to give a drug, don't give a drug, do an operation, don't do an operation. So that um, so these binary decisions are fascinating, and um, and uh, and so in in wanting to study the way people balance off these decisions, we we come on to the fact that the visual diagnosis is a, is a, is a great framework because if it boils down and 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 this is a this is in the tradition of uh, of what the McMaster group has done for a lot a lot of years, is that um, is by by taking a stimulus and and stripping away the extraneous stuff but keeping the essential part of it, the atomic unit part of it. You can, um, you can study something and know what it means at the end of it. So, that, uh, so, that, and, uh, so these visual stimuli, should I send this child to daycare, yes or no? Um, <laughs> Is uh, is you know it kind of brings it down to the inst really quite uh, quite interesting and it's always been remarkable to me that the squiggles on this piece of paper distinguish between somebody somebody being put out in the waiting room to wait for four or five hours versus thirty people descending on them and rushing them to the cath lab and doing all sorts of invasive things or basic life threatening things and based on the time pressures and then what we studied uh, at the start which was ankle X-rays and so that uh, so we either I have to cast this person or I don't, and then it's based on me figuring out whether or not they've got a fracture and so on. So, that, uh, so, that's, uh, so the outline is that I'm going to show this model of medical decision making and, and, and try, and, try and make some points around what we can learn from that. I'm going to make an argument for the statistical modeling of this, but, uh, but in a constructivist fashion. In a, in a, we don't have a, a one objective truth about the way the statistics should be done. Instead, it's a, it's a more fluid thing that, um, that, uh, that needs to take into account the, the the variable nature of the whole thing, and, um, and and a lot of this is enabled by the potential of learning analytics, meaning our new ways of being able to, being able to pull data in around this this decision, and um, and to use that data in the statistical models to to, to try and figure out what's happening. So um, so the so our first study, and um, and uh, and we you know sort of. Uh, Published probably too much around this study, but the um, but the was a, was a study in which um, Kathy Buddhis gave a talk and, and and was doing clinical research around ankle X-rays, and I went up to her afterwards and said, you know, so you have the medical record numbers of hundreds of people with ankle X-rays. Um, let's make an educational intervention out of it. And it, was, it was as simple as that. And, uh, and our idea was to create something that you could practice. And what we did was we downloaded two years worth of ankle x-rays, or two years worth of a full-time pediatric emergency doctor's uh, practice would be somewhere around 200 ankle x-rays over that time. And the idea was to crunch that into a computer application where, you know, like a violinist practicing their scales, you could practice your ankle x-rays, as, as boring as they might sound. Practicing scales, kind of things. So I think it lines up. And um, and uh, and what we did was we digitized these and um, and uh, and put them up so that you could look at the at the three views that make up an ankle series. And so that uh, so this is the the ankle straight on. This is the ankle a little bit oblique. And then this is the ankle from the side. And so you can look at all three of those views. And we put a little bit of story to it. This is a 16-year-old who fell while skateboarding obliquely on his ankle. And um, and so just the the task that a, that a radiologist or an emergency doctor would have. And it's totally you make the call, and so that, uh, so that they would click on one of those, and up would come a view of the, of the ankle, and they would have to puzzle over it, and then declare the thing either normal or abnormal, and we put in these tricky words to get a sense of how sure they were. And then, um, and then if they thought it was abnormal, the mouse cursor would turn into a yellow dot that they could put wherever they wanted, and if they thought the fracture was here, they would put the yellow dot there, and then click Submit. 
and the clicking submit was a one-way kind of thing that then gave you feedback. And, uh, and the feedback was either you got it right in the, in the sense that you declared it normal or abnormal, and it was abnormal. And if it was abnormal, you put the yellow dot inside of a, of a range that said that you, uh, that, that you had, had that right. And, uh, and, then we, and then we put the text of the radiology report in there as well, and so that, uh, so that the full radiologist report was there saying, you know, sort of this is a, a T low fracture or whatever, whatever it was, and um, uh, based on you know, sort of what they were seeing. And um, and and you know, true to that scales idea, we had you know, you did your first case, you did your second case, and you did your two hundred thirty fourth case, and you just plowed through these in a in a steady fashion, um, answering them as though they were questions, as though they were multiple choice questions, as though it was a test, and and, and people are familiar with that. And yet, a lot more is going on in the background in terms of um, you developing expertise from a from a visual diagnosis sense. So, um, so again, we, we had this naive notion of fidelity, where the fidelity was to the spectrum of illness, and so that the, so that of the 234 cases, two thirds of them were normal, which is what my world is like, and then and then the one third that are abnormal, the majority of those are Salter Harris one fractures or or, or Salter Harris two fractures, and you know it doesn't matter what that is, but the but the gist of it is that the majority of them were were of one type, and then there were rare things, and there were certain things that only happened once within the within the whole set and we made that kind of trade-off in, in favor of fidelity as opposed to um, necessarily enriching the set for, uh, for what we're trying to learn. And, um, and again, naively, this was you know, a, a shot at, at creating deliberate practice, that idea of scales for a musician, something that, uh, that as a pediatric emergency doctor, we would create this environment in which we could practice you up, as opposed to the standard in which uh, the way I learned ankle x-rays is to sit in the emergency department and wait till somebody limps in and then, uh, and then, uh, and then see what I can figure out from, uh, from that. And, um, and so, uh, so what I'm what I'm going to do now? That's the frame, and the um, what I'm going to do now is tie my shoelace. But the uh, the other um, the other thing is is what I'd like to do is is just don't get assaulted, Harris. Draw, draw, <laughs> draw. <laughs> I thought that was a metaphor with liver practice. <laughs> <laughs> the way I draw my shoelace, <laughs> 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 ten thousand times. <laughs> you see, my son's draw shy of their shoelaces. They're awful. I know they are sort awful. Of, sort of the El Velcro A and <laughs> <laughs> so watching. <laughs> Watching them tie shoelaces should be, you know, kind of a. Family story. The um, so we live, so we lived for many years in an apartment in uh, in New York, and and in this apartment was a Seinfeld kind of setup in which uh, in which we have a door, and then our neighbors have a have have a four doors around us, and we're all within kind of ten meters of, of each other on this thing, and, and we have a dog, a little dog named Balto, and and um, and then across the way was it was a dog named Toby, and Toby's a black lab, a big dog, and um, and uh, and we get along famously with all of these neighbors, but Toby was somewhat of a, something of a problem. And so, so you'd go into the elevator, and Toby was about this tall, and, and as soon as Toby went into the elevator, he would put his snout at whoever's crotch was, was available. At the, um, and so it was just annoying, you had to stand in <laughs> kind, of, kind of awkward, awkward ways. And it was fine for me, I rarely wear a dress, but the, um, it, was, it was worse for Andrea. And, the, um, and, and, then, and then my dog didn't like this dog, and so that they would, you know, kind of, Kind of be at it the whole time and growling when when we were gonna the thing and, and and that got elaborated with my fa within my family to kind of a, um, whenever anything bad happened well Toby was somehow involved we know he was and, and he would uh, and so that if uh, if your shoelace broke well then Toby had carefully filed it down so that it was about to break and then and then he brought it across and it was this um, this idea of Toby undermining you know like the under Toad or, um, or Moriarty, this miasma of badness who is associated with Toby. And again, we love these neighbors and the dog's fine and the whole bit, but it was, a, it was this myth we all involved in. And so as I was preparing this talk, I thought, well, what if Toby was, a, was a, an evil psychometrician who was trying to undermine us good-natured emergency doctors in, in learning, uh, learning about our things? And so that, um, so with all respects to any psychometricians in the room. People or otherwise. I do joke for the rest of the year. <laughs> You're right, <it's> <laughs> So the um, so so Toby says you should report accuracy to say how good a doctor is. 
So, but, um, and, and we all have this experience, you sit down in grade school and you do a test and you get some of the questions right and you get some of the questions wrong and then they give you a mark which is the, you got this many right and this many wrong and the percentage is what gets reflected back to you. And the, um, and the thing is, is that that, you know, there's sort of, it's good to have a high percentage, and if my high, my percentage is 4% uh, is, uh, lower than Dr. Sherbino's, well then, then Dr. Sherbino's better at this, but how much better, and, and, and what circumstances, and, and that kind of thing, is what it doesn't, doesn't tell us, and yet this is pervasive. This is everywhere. You know, sort of, we, we did a systematic review recently of ECG studies, and, and out of the 60 studies or whatever we isolated, all of them report this. And so that um, very, very rarely an ROC curve or those, or those sorts of things. And the, um, and the thing is that accuracy is just not a good measure for what I do because it doesn't correctly represent our task. And our task is, is, to, um, is, to, is to get things right. And so if there is a fracture there, then we want me to be saying that there is a fracture there, and this is the way I can get it right. And if there is no fracture there, and I say there isn't one, then this is the other way of getting it right. And so those two things, right being right is good, right? So that's the part that accuracy does well. But the thing is that if, um, if there is no fracture there and I say there is one, then it's kind of inconvenient and embarrassing. I send somebody off in a cast who didn't need one, and so, the time, so they get it taken off a few days later when we figure it out. But if I said there is no fracture there and they limp off and then they displace their fracture and make it worse because I did not put a cast on when I could have, then, then that's a negative outcome for the patient. So this is a much worse square. A false negative is much worse than a false positive in this particular scenario. And if you change it from ankle x-rays to cervical spine x-rays, you can, you can imagine that this is, a, this is you know, sort of tenfold, hundredfold worse in error than this is. And that's the reason we put everybody in, in collars where there's even a whiff of, of, of things. And so this balancing of true po of false positives against false negatives and the risk is an essential thing to, um, to what I do as a physician and so that these test characteristics um, allow us to get at that trade-off. And our particular set, you know, usually when people learn about ankle x-rays, it's a butterfly collection. It's a whole bunch of abnormals and the question is which abnormal is it? And that's the thing that's not true to my task in the sense that my task is to fish out abnormals amongst all the normals. And so that, um, so that, uh, so that here's, um, here's a representation of the, the difficulty of the 234 x-rays. And so this is the most difficult x-ray here, and this is the least difficult x-ray here. And in blue are the normal cases, and in mauve are the abnormal cases. And what we thought we would find is that the abnormal cases would all be way over there on the difficult side, and, the, um, and that the normal cases might, might be sort of clustered over there, and what would the overlap be, and those overlap cases would be quite interesting. And yet you can see that there's a tremendous overlap between what's, uh, what's normal and what's abnormal in terms of the difficulty that people perceive within this set of 234. So, um, so that, um, so that, uh, so ultimately, we we started reporting these test characteristics as being a way of, of 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 assessing somebody, and so that it makes much more sense that if my sensitivity specificity is blank and blank, then we can compare Dr. Sherbino and I, and you can pretty in particular compare people who 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 under investigate at the risk of missing stuff versus people who over investigate at the risk of spending too much in the way of resources, and so that, uh, so again. That's a, a fundamental thing to what physicians do. And, the, um, and here's an example of it, is that if I represent how good you are in, in terms of a likelihood ratio, an LR positive in this, kind of, in this case, then if I have a sense of the pretest likelihoods, now I can get into the prediction business. I can predict how often I will make a mistake in terms of post-test probability at the level of the patient. And start to express things in terms of in terms of proper error rate. And my point in here is is that a radiologist may be much better at the at the um, at the at the task, and they may have an LR positive thing. But I, as an emergency doctor, have a much better sense of what the pretest likelihood is because I've got the patient in front of me. And so that um, so that this brings out the trade-offs there as well, and allows me to again judge the intervention not just based on sort of sort of a number at the level of the of the practitioner, but at, at, in terms of its implications for the patients and in terms of our error rates. 
And so, um, so, so far, you know, my, my worry about what Toby's doing is, is that he's got this um, sy systematic way of representing how good I am in terms of accuracy, but, um, but isn't, a, isn't bringing forth, you know, sort of my ability to trade off sensitivity and specificity. So we, um, so we took these 234 x-rays and we gave them to five types of people, and so medical students at one end, all the way to pediatric radiologists at the other, and we had them do all of these cases. And, the, um, and, uh, and, um, and so that this was across five institutions, it took them hours to do all two, 234, and at the end of it, the, the learners learned, and, and it was successful in, 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 terms, of, in terms of that. And um, and so that uh, so this was uh, you know my awkward state a moment in the in the sense that up is good here so this is essentially the area under the ROC curve and then these are the the five char characteristics and if this had been backward I'd have been in a lot of trouble right and so that uh, but thankfully the pediatric radiologists were better than the pediatric emergency medicine attendings the fellows and the residents were roughly the same and then the medical students um, as expected you know sort of had a harder time with with doing this. But, the, um, but again, this represents the task as, a, as an exam. This is like taking 234 questions and saying, you know, kind of what's the point estimate, what's the class average for the medical students, and so on. And so that, that gives you a certain amount of information. I can claim that my thing you know, sort of sorts people roughly the way that, that you would accept. But a lot of information is lost in terms of just lumping all of this together. And so that, um, so that that's a Tobyism number two, is that when you test, you should, all, you should never learn during the test. And so that giving feedback during a test is an anathema to a summative or a research kind of, a, kind of assessment of somebody's ability. And so that Toby has carefully separated those two so that we only, only test people with no feedback over here and we only, only learn over here without you know, sort of worrying too much about the, about the metrics as we go along. And so that, uh, so we'd like to explode that as well in the sense that as these, not all of these four items that this person did are created equal. Remember, we were giving them feedback. And so, so the whole idea behind feedback is that you get better. And so that, so that on the first one, the first time you see a Salter Harris one fracture, you, you get it wrong, but you learn about it, you get the feedback, you see what's happened. And then that influences item number 10, where another Salter Harris fracture shows up, and, uh, and you've, um, and you've seen, a, seen a new one. And so, that, um, so we turned this on its side and we, and we looked at how good you were from your first one all the way up to your 234th one. And this is a cumulative moving average, but the, but the same sort of thing comes out if you, if you do a sliding window moving average. And the, and the gist of it is this is one person, and this one person represented in terms of their likelihood ratio positive. So again, one of those test characteristics. And the way this works is there's a bunch of statistical noise until you get to about the 20th case, and then a jagged line showing overall improvement uh, like the, you would want the stock market to improve. And, um, and then here's another person who has somewhat different pattern, but again, improving all the way out to the, uh, to the 234th case. We thought that 234 was too many cases and that everybody would plateau off and that we would report that it takes 137 cases to master um, ankle x-rays. Well, they need quite the truth. And the, um, so here's another person, and, and I've cherry picked, you know, kind of the, the best of the learning curves here. But the, um, but but roughly two thirds, when we, when we looked at them, had had some form of uh, of this sort of this kind of quasi monotonic um, uh, progression in terms of the way they learn. And here here are the learners, the residents, and fellows throughout this, and you can see the tremendous variability as you go across. And so that uh, so this person was pretty good at it already, and sort of is well above an arbitrary competency. Level. Line there. This person learns and crosses the line and solidifies it as they as they go along. This person here struggles and is really just barely kisses the competency line at the very end of the end of their um, end of their experience. And then Toby snuck into my city <laughs> and answered all the questions wrong, and I got a <laughs> negative learning curve, which uh, um, added noise to my results. <laughs> <laughs> like a good psychometrician. You just throw it. <laughs> exactly, I'm just going to stab it. <laughs> <laughs>
All resemblances to any people living or deceased are accidental. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so, this, so this Rose and I affectionately refer to as the spaghetti plot. It looks like somebody threw the, threw the thing up against the wall, but there's a certain truth in here in the sense that averaged just looks great. It sort of follows the power law distribution that you would, uh, that you would anticipate for learning. But the lived experience of our learners is anything but this. So that, um, so in fact, this would be the exception. And so that this person's um, experience of these 234 ankle X-rays is vastly different from this person. And so again, it constructed a sense of, of, of we're all different. We all get to this particular thing. And so even though they're all the same X-rays, the way they go through them, based on who they were coming up to it and their particular um, particular background and abilities and the like, shows up in this tremendous heterogeneity. And yet I, as an educator can take heart from the fact that it's, it's supremely variable and again sort of some of this is statistical noise but the uh, but the but the gist of it being that you can sort of get this impression of increasing reliability and that the difference between the worst and the best um, at the end of the education is certainly much better than uh, than it was at the start and so part of what I'm accomplishing is I'm getting people up higher but part of what I'm accomplishing is that I'm decreasing the interperson variability as well and that the, and that this thing manifests in a way along the lines that shows us, you know, kind of what the process looks like. And, um, and so, the, um, so when we break this out according to your level, then, then interesting patterns come out as well. And so that the radiology attendings didn't learn anything from this. They weren't meant to learn from this. It wasn't to learn, you know, sort of these, these cases were, were what their daily job is. And so basically, once they settled into, into the, um, and got oriented to the thing, they had a nice flat line. The EM attendings learned some, but settled into their own flat line, which has a delta with the, um, with the pediatric radiologist. The, the thing worked the best, almost, for pediatric residents, who started off not as good as the fellows, but rapidly narrowed that down, so by the end of it, they're, they're essentially indistinguishable. And the fellows you know, kind of learned in their slow, steady rate. And, and in many respects, what you could do is you could think about this thing being an extension of this, and that they're just in different places where they started off with. And so that these, pe these people were residents at a certain time. And if you bring it across, then, then, they, then they tie together quite nicely. And so it, so it speaks to a continuum of learning. And it speaks to, in many respects, the artificiality of this, because eventually these fellows will get to be EM attendings. But what's happening now is that they do that over the first five years of their practice as opposed to in fellowship. That's what I point out. And then this I feel quite guilty about. These are the medical students. They learned over the first hundred. But they didn't have the vocabulary to extract the feedback the way the, the residents and fellows did. And so that to them, what a Salter Harris fracture two is, or what a what a fibula is, was a, was an interesting question. And so that, uh, so, that uh, so it must have been must have been torture to be doing these cases over and over and over again, and, and not seeing yourself getting better at it. And, and um, and they you know one of the interesting things you know the whole competency movement started in the middle of this and um, and what we what we got is got a you know, sort of good sense of is the development uh, and what we're aiming for was the development of competency and so here's two people with very very different prior knowledge and very very different paths through the um, through the 234 cases. And you know, kind of in the old days, the way you did this in terms of a time constant competency variables type of setup was thou shalt do 150 cases or thou shalt practice for two hours. And you would graduate with a delta between these two people. And what you would hope is, is that the minimum competence was, uh, was set at a place that had both of them up, up above it. But patients hate that kind of variability. And so, so, the, so the competency based uh, time variable type of setup is thou shall be this good. 
and so that uh, and then your path that your path towards goodness is variable and our jobs as educators is to take ownership of this path and to help and to coach and to and to bring people across and to recognize the differences so that everybody ends up here and then everybody ends up at roughly the roughly or decreased uh, our the reliability of our product becomes the, the, the focus there and learning curves are just a natural representation of the way you would uh, the way you would show that and you can do math on this and so that uh, so here's the um, here's the Thurston learning curve and the, and the Thurston learning curve is essentially a power law and, um, and it has a, but, the, but it has all the things that you would anticipate in a learning system. So it, so it has a y-intercept. You come into it with a prior knowledge, and that prior knowledge is not zero. Everybody can read ankle x-rays to a, to a certain extent. And then it has a slope, and so some people learn slowly, and some people learn quickly. And, and some people learn slowly and quickly based on the way I set up the feedback and my instructional design. And what I would want is that, is that a naive instructional design, and then I, then I teach better, and then I teach better, so that they're getting more and more efficient as, um, as I get better and better at teaching the particular thing. And the way I know that I'm succeeding is I take ownership of the slope. So that the, the amount of learning per unit time or per unit effort is the is the thing, and so that so the time's explicitly in this thing. And then there's an asymptote which says that if I keep doing this forever, how good can I be? And so that um, so it starts to within the limits of the system that you develop give you a sense of what excellence looks like. So that um, so the how you know what is the potential of somebody learning ankle X-rays, and so we haven't done these studies, but eventually what we'd like to do is to get people to practice so much what the base rate of error is, and how how and what does it take to drive the error rate down to zero. Right? So that um, so it's so fascinating, but it, but the but the gist of it is is that you can see that you level off and you become asymptotic out into infinity. So that uh, so the question of how close to infinity do I want to take ankle X-rays as opposed to the other thing is um, is an interesting is an interesting. Sorry, Martin. Did, did you try to model anything with those data? Or and what you mean by that is? Uh, I guess using complicated stats to determine how many of those individuals what it might take. So once that went down. How many more it might take to, to go back? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, so, so we do that. It's 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 fascinating how difficult it is. And so offline we'll go, we'll go into it. But, but, but what we what we've gotten to is um is uh, is now modeling what the prediction interval is. And so that what I know about you so far and what I know about people like you, you sort of through a multi-level model, you, you take um you take the information from the people like you and you take how much I know while you got to your hundredth case. And then, and then guess at how many more cases you have to do in order to get to some something, and then and then model the the confidence interval around that, so that I still have a sense of what's happening there. And so that um, so we have done that. We've uh, we created a number needed to achieve benchmark. And so that um, so that uh, so that uh, we set the benchmark, and then we say, you know, okay, your prediction based on your learning curve uh, that you, the number of cases you would have to do in order to hit it is blank. The problem is that the that the um, that the confidence of around that are way bigger than you and I want. And so that um, so that uh, so that uh, you know, again, naively, I would have hoped that the confidence interval would would, would go down like this. And if you and if you um, and if you look at uh, you know, if you take the learning curve, you know, kind of thing, the confidence interval for the the learning curve itself narrows quite nicely and looks beautiful. So sort of, sort of at the end of it, you know, kind of, I'm fairly fairly certain that the that the that the you know, kind of the, the the terminal competence of this person in terms of uh, in terms of their accuracy is this sort of from a, from an overall across the group thing, but what what that that kind of lies in its own way, right? It's its own Tobyism because you know so the lived experience of this person has nothing to do with that confidence interval, and my my prediction from here as to that the person would end up there would have it would have an interval that looks like this, and so that um, so it's so it's so you know kind of our holy grail of what we really wanted has been somewhat disappointing so far. I'm Wondering if you can start adding other information to that book. Oh, segue. That's fine. <laughs> Sorry, uh, but Leslie had a question. Well, well, you want to answer mine. It might be some way on the line. 
might be similar along those lines. Do you think that a lot of the breadth of the confidence that it rolls because of who is included? Like you have your experts and then your your non experts Yeah, but that that's that that spaghetti plot is from our residents and fellows only. Okay. Right. So, that's a great question. Do you have any sense of decay? I mean this is a test of four hours where they finish. So this is acute learning. Yeah. Uh, and that the way that someone that you, if you actually plotted how it decays, not just that it decays. Right. I mean, if it ever saw another right going through eight point, it would decay. Right. right. But you would assume that. But how much it decays, and which groups it decays, at what rate, and what individual rates of decay there are, itself right. might be interesting. Yeah. 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 And so, um, uh, so, so bless their souls. Um, um, Kathy and Marty did a one-year study, and so that they had people do 80 um, elbow X-rays with feedback, plotted nice learning curves, and so people got a lot better. And then did a 20-item test right immediately afterwards, and so that uh, so established with 100 X-rays, you know, kind of um, improvement in that they had. And then over a one-year period, every two months, gave them a 20-item test. And they get, and and, one, and had four groups. One group they, they did nothing and just measured them at the one year mark. And the, the one year mark, their ability was the same as their y-intercept when they started. So, and the um the they had to, we had um three three groups otherwise. One that just got tested with no feedback, and that had a, that had a decay curve, but um but by and large preserved its gains. And then, and then we had testing groups with feedback. And again, our naive impression was was that the feedback would be the thing. And the way this would work is that the no intervention at all would be low. The just testing would also be low. And then our feedback once would show a dose response curve. Which, uh, you know, so we fed back with uh, with two of the sessions and then with four of the sessions. Yeah, and instead, all three of these were indistinguishable, so that there was a testing effect. Um, ended up counting the learn forgetting curve, but we did show uh, show forgetting in the in the complete control. Because that's when it gets to linking competency to expertise, in terms of durable expertise. Right, right. How much of it counts? That's right. What do you have to do? And so, um, so the next Tobyism is that we often, you know, sort of, if um, if we're modeling, you know, kind of somebody's ability. We tend to do it uh, in terms of that accuracy thing, how many questions did you get right, but we tend not to incorporate other information that we have about you. And so that, uh, so that the, the whole modeling idea is as, um, as brought forth earlier. And so that, um, so that we've done studies with, uh, with various ones of these, and so that probably definitely has some signal in it and the like, but the, but the one I'd like to I'd like to just show you um, is the is this fluidity idea, and so the um, so this is um, this is the residents within this ankle study, and they and they and these particular residents learned to about the hundred case mark and then plateaued, and so that they were they were you know kind of done learning and would see themselves as being sort of not necessarily getting any better uh, across here. So that um, so that what it would feel like is is that this is mastery. And so that this is this is where uh, if if it was left up to them as to when they would quit, and we haven't empirically done this, but uh, but it would be reasonable to quit there. You know, sort of I don't feel like I'm getting any better or here or whatever. But what's uh, but look at their time per case. And so it starts off at 80 seconds up here per case. And then bubbles down, and then sort of at that point they were they were at about the 55 seconds per case, and or maybe a bit lower. But they but they end eventually sort of go down in again a learning curve kind of asymptotic fashion down to whatever this is 30 seconds per case, while by and large maintaining their accuracy. You can argue about the boredom here and that they tailed off, but the uh, but it, but it's kind of like you know when you learn how to type, you first learn how to type with 95% accuracy, and then you hold your accuracy at 95% while hopefully chunking and doing all those good things in the background that allow you to become more fluid with the thing. And so my kids know that I don't think, you know, sort of I go around with this mantra, you don't know it until you're bored, and so don't come back to me complaining about being bored, you know, sort of that's the goal. And, um, and so that, uh, so that they, but it's a tough message, right? You know, sort of, uh, sort of saying that I want you reading x-rays so well that you can do it in 30 seconds and maintaining your accuracy. 
And so they, you can see building a learning thing in which it gradually sort of starts to ping the thing at you with time. And this is very, very controversial. Physicians hate learning. They hate the idea of being constrained by time. But, um, but time accuracy trade-offs are, again, throughout my life. And, and so that the pediatric radiologist who's meant to be cranking through has a time, time value trade-off. And, and, um, and yet the, the instructional manipulation of this is a completely unexplored thing. What that shows us is that, in fact, there is no time accuracy trade-off. Right, right. Well, to, within those constraints, right? Because we'll find the actual faster. Yeah, exactly. But the, um, but the whole question of whether that's an emergent phenomenon, so it comes along as you become better, and if that's the case, then I can use time as, uh, to, add, to add to a model suggesting how good you are. Or it's, um, it's an additional thing, an additional constraint within the system in which it'd be interesting to me how time interacts with your developing expertise. And so both of those things of interest and both of those things are reasons we're here today. <laughs> Um, you know, and analyzing the path through which they're, um, they're getting to their expertise is fascinating because we can intercede. And so, so, that, um, so here's, um, here's the amount of time they spent on each of the five screens that, that make up a case. And so, so this is the history screen. So this person spent almost 40 seconds on the history. I don't know why. And then um, and here's 15 seconds on the AP, about 10 seconds on the oblique. They didn't even look at the last and then they reported out their uh, their answer and the um, and uh, and in this case they got it right but you can see the amount of detail I can get in terms of the way they read one case and so here's a bunch of cases and so that uh, so this one here this is a nice progressive person who is compulsive about seeing every case and they spend the right amount of time on each thing but again quite a bit of time on the history this is a person with attention deficit disorder. <laughs> <laughs> every one of the cases all the way across, and then finally declares what, what they think is happening. I was doing automatically. <laughs> <laughs> Again, all coincidences that seem to be with living persons or anything. <laughs> so, um, so, that, uh, so here's a person who skips views, and the computer knows you skipped the view, right? So this is totally accessible to me and you in terms of instructional design. And so that I, that I can see and sort of set the computer to start fl blinking that you're a person who skips views, and that just ain't kosher in terms of, uh, in terms of reading ankle x-rays. Mark, are the stimuli presented sequentially, or do you do my track? Uh, we're not doing eye tracking, we're doing a poor man's eye tracking in the sense of that we, they, they access those three views in whatever order they want to and they spend as much time as they will want on, on each of those. So you're doing it sequentially, they're looking at one at a time. And That's right. Back or forward. Right. When you said sequentially, I meant I thought you meant order. But yeah, it's a little bit Well, the poor man's eye tracking is you looking for people staring. <laughs> 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 That's right. So the um, but but we can also besides these deficits we can we can we can celebrate good behaviors. And so the, here's a person who goes through straight through, sees something, and then double checks it in the other two views to make sure that the thing that they saw is represented in the other two views, which we know is a positive behavior of radiologists, and then pulls the trigger on giving the answer. So, that, um, so that's an adaptive behavior. And then here's another one. This person sees the history, looks at the, looks at the x-ray, sees something on the x-ray, and then double checks that it's consistent with the history. You know, sort of a person's tender over the lateral malleolus. Well, it's the thing that I saw um, you know, lateral or medial. And so that, um, so that they double check that and then progress to seeing the other things are going on forward. And so, so again, these are things that are easy for the computer to detect. And then similarly, across 234 cases, across a number of people, we were able to show that there, the people who show this behavior are, are more accurate, and so that um, pound for pound, and so that um, so we can incorporate this into our models as well, in terms of coming up with a model that's not just empirically about did you get it right or not, but starts to look at some of the process elements that go into, the, into in getting it right. And so I would rather that a person show a good process and get it wrong than that they show, you know, sort of a bad process, say they, say they got this one right, and, and got it right, you know, so that that's, um, that's, not, that's not where I want to be. I don't know if you can, I agree, you could flip that and say that they're using that process because there's something about them, right, as opposed to showing them the green version of it and saying this is the way you should scan images, right. understanding why they're doing it that way. Right. 
Right. But so then you have some of the studies just done with spatial mobility. Right. Right. But, the, but that's that's the dance. That's what teaching is, right? And so that um, so it's it's kind of um, you know, where where are you? Here's the way I do it, and then you incorporate it, and, and you go back and forth. And so that it's, so again, it's that some things emerge as you get better at it, and 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 so that so that you're just kind of showing what's happening organically. But some things I intercede with, with you know, as you can imagine, me saying, "Look, yet again, you forgot to re check with the history, and that's a that's a rule that you need to you need to internalize." Because, because um, in some of our some of our other studies, you know, the um, so we did a think aloud study that uh, <coughs> that um, in which um, in which we had people um, had people you know kind of voice aloud what was going on as they as they did the did the um, did the X rays. And, uh, and, and one of the things that, they, that the radiologists voiced aloud were rules that had, been, uh, that had been published and were part of the domain. And so those rules for novices, it's a thousand monkeys and a thousand typewriters until they were ever going to show up with those rules. Right? And so, so in fact, the radiology community took a number of years until somebody Swiss Chuck published Swiss Chuck's eponymous rule. And then he published it, it got peer reviewed, the community thought about it the whole bit, and then it got canonized and became sort of a thing within the community. And so that, um, so again, you know, the, so the degree to which, that's what you know, I think teaching looks like, is to take somebody like this and to say, a rule is, thou shalt never again skip a view, and, um, and my claim would be that the world would be better. <laughs> Um, uh, so, so this is uh, this one here is the reason we're here, and the um, and so that uh, Tobiasm number four is that thou shalt dissociate um, psychometric scales from the real world, and the um, and so the uh, so you know I talked a bit about this in the in the sense that going from something like accuracy to something where I can measure it at the level of the patient, that's what we're trying to do. And in IRT modeling, so that this is one x-ray, and this is a, an item characteristic curve of one x-ray, and what it is, is, is it's kind of a lethal dose, dose 50 estimation for this, uh, for this thing, is that where is the 50% mark where I'm 50% likely to get it right, Versus getting it wrong, and so that um, so that um, and this is this is the ability scale, and so a person of high ability would be a hundred percent likely to get this right. A person of really really low ability would have would be completely overmatched by this question, and then a person of medium <coughs> ability would be 50-50 with this question. And an easy question looks like this, and a hard question looks like this, and and but we report difficulties of items according to where they show up on this scale. The thing is that while this can be a psychometrically continuous scale, it ends up being a functionally ordinal scale. Because again, it ends up being this thing in which Toby cleverly decided that this would be called theta. And so that um, so thereby ensuring that it had no relevance to the real world. And so that uh, and um, and so my theta might be two, and Dr. Sherbino's theta might be three, and Toby would be happy that that was a one logit difference. Toby cleverly called it a logit, and then when he explains it, he says, "Oh, that's just the log of the odds ratio." <laughs> That's clarifying. <laughs> Mark, it's so helpful I have someone to blame now for my lack of understanding for my RT. Right, exactly. Oh, totally. 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 <laughs> so, so Toby helpfully gives us this display, so that um, in which, you know, to his credit, he's put all the items, and so this is the world's easiest ankle X-ray, and this is the world's hardest ankle X-ray, and they all kind of normally distributed around the average zero logit um, ankle X-ray, and then here's where I can put people, and so that uh, so if I'm a one logit person, then I should be seeing this X-ray, and I and, and in theory, 50% likelihood that I'm going to answer that x-ray on an x-ray thing. But this scale is something called difficulty. And difficulty doesn't help my patient. I mean, you're in here with a difficult ankle x-ray. You know, sort of doesn't, uh, doesn't really tie into, you know, kind of where, the, where they're at. So, um, so, so, so Rose and I, with, with a, a bunch of other people, did this study in which we, um, 
in which we showed them, it showed them ECGs that could be pericarditis or could be an ST elevation MI. So myocardial infarction, and this is a distinction that's a big deal. These are the people who get rushed to the cath lab with dangerous procedures. These are the people who get an aspirin and wait in the waiting room. And so that um, so a considerable you know, import, and where you draw that you know, sort of cut point is, is quite interesting. And, the, um, and again, you know, sort of it can be dichotomized, pericarditis, not pericarditis, or we can you know, kind of start to, start to create a scale of you're definitely an ST elevation MI, or you're definitely pericarditis, Pericarditis, but you could be somewhere in here. And again, in terms of me as a physician, this stuff is easy. This stuff is what I get paid for, right? So in terms, in terms so of that's what you refer to internal medicine. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what I get paid for. <laughs> Silly. <laughs> And so that I drew this line in the wrong place, so, so that the, uh, but you get the idea is that that line can be a, can be a cut point. And so, so we've, we've, we've tried to develop these things called decision aligned measurement models. And so what I'm going to show you is um, 20 items, 20 ECGs that had various levels of pericarditis and, and ST elevation MI. Um, it's going to take me about three, four minutes to present this. Is okay for the time check? I don't sign the clock. So, okay. And the um, and so that um, so with varying degrees of the degree of of confusability, and um, and and we had everybody rate it on this scale, and so they had to choose one of these five things. And again, they would get beat. Uh, no, not in the study. They didn't get feedback because we were being told the issues test. And um, and so so ultimately, we got back this. This Gutman-like grid, and um, and I'll walk you through this. But um, but this is um, these are the cases. So it's one row per case, and then these are the people. So this is a, this is the first resident who did it, the second, the third, and so on. And then and then these are their answers for each of these cases. And so here the person said definitely pericarditis, and so all of these reds are definitely pericarditis, either pericarditis or STEMI, probably STEMI, and then definitely STEMI on down here. And the um, and we did this IRT modeling, and, and, I'll, and we're going to get into it later. But the but the gist of it is this case across all the people who did it, sort of ended up being the one that was most typically pericarditis. And this case, out of all the people who did it, was the most typically ST elevation MI uh, at the, uh, the under, other end of the scale. And you can see across these, these people, there's high degree of agreement that this was a STEMI. And across these people, there was something of agreement that, the, that this was pericarditis up here. And you can see in an ideal world, the way this would look is you go from dark red to pink to yellow to light green to dark green would be the way we would want the world to work. But if it worked that way, then that would have been algorithmized and it wouldn't be a subject to study. And instead, this is a difficult distinction. And so difficult distinction in different people. And so this person is protecting themselves by calling some things that are pericarditis and that other people think are pericarditis, STEMIs. And so that, um, and again, this is that false positives are better than false negatives type of thing. And so that if down here, this one's a problem because everybody else thinks this is a STEMI, and on our scale, it's the most likely to be STEMI, except this person thought it was probably pericarditis. And if on that basis they're not doing, this person is a cowboyish in terms of sort of taking risks. Whereas this person might be overcautious and that they're all green along there. So, and the core of the idea here is that across a grid of 36 people, we can use that IRT machinery that Toby built and represented with difficulty to service the way we distinguish across pericarditis and STEMI. And so we can use that to probabilistically report to this person not just their answers to the test, but a probabilistic representation of if they were to do this test a hundred times, what would their tendencies look like and how would they represent this decision based on the experience of everybody else. So again, it's this idea of a, of a, of a group and forming an individual. And so that what that ends up looking like, and, and this is probably where I'll end, is um, is this representation, and, um, and this is uh, this is from a separate study where there are only four categories, but the principle applies. 
in that, um, in that what we've done with the scale is we've abolished the idea of difficulty and instead we've created a scale that goes from you're definitely an ST elevation MI to you're definitely not an ST elevation MI. Stuff that matters to patients, right? And so stuff that happens in the real world and it represents the decision I have to make, that five point gradation of, you know, sort of definitely I want to be calling this a pericarditis and definitely I would want to be calling it a, this an ST elevation MI. And you see here that the scale works to, you know, on a base validity kind of basis. And so that, uh, so lots of X's over this, uh, this part, lots of triangles over here, and then a bunch of, um, a bunch of overlap in the middle in which um, there are cases where I can't tell one way or the other. And so, so, that, so that across the group, they've sorted all of these cases according to where on this psychometric scale the phenotype shows up as being representative of ST elevation MI or pericarditis. And so on that Gutman grid, this is, that's what this is. And so this is minus one logits all the way to plus two logits. And you can see that when we chose our cases, we did a pretty good job in terms of representing all the way down the scale and having, having examples from each and every part. And so they done, and so, but this, this thing here is a category characteristic curve for a person. This is a rater number 1,000, and, and the, we didn't do that many people, but it, is, so it, so it makes us feel good when we have big numbers. <laughs> rater one is kind of, yeah. <laughs> and recruitment was a problem. And, um, and so, so what this shows is that this is the probability that the person would choose definitely STEMI. And so for 15 of the cases, that's the category they chose. And so for cases that are up here, this person would be very, very likely to call it a STEMI. And so this case here, this person would almost 100% of the time call it a STEMI. And then this category over here is definitely not STEMI, so in the other studies, pericarditis. And sort of for a case that's here, this person would 75% of the time call it a pericarditis. But 25% of the time, they would call, or definitely pericarditis. And then 25% of the time, they would hedge their bets. They would say it was prob probably um, pericarditis, this, uh, this second category. And then this is probably STEMI. And so what's interesting here are these thresholds where a person goes from calling a case probably STEMI to calling a case definitely STEMI. And so we can drop a plumb line down here, and we can go exactly to that case pull that case out of our file and then sit down and say, why is this your, your border case between these two particular categories? Now the, now the patient may not care of the probably definitely distinction, but they sure as hell care about the definitely STEMI versus definitely not STEMI kind of thing. And you can see that this person's curves don't overlap hardly at all. And so when this person says definitely one or definitely the other, they exactly divide these things really, really quite nicely. But what, you'll, what, um, but what we have to be concerned about is how good are cardiologists in general in terms of separating this out. And so what we would want to know is are all the diamonds or triangles over to the left of that and are all the X's to the right of it and to what extent is that true? And we can do that with signal detection modeling, two by two curves and the whole bit. But what this is trying to get to is a representation of the way people separate things out along the scale. And to kind of wrap it up in terms of time is, is that the potential of this is that instead of me teaching items, I'm going across items, I choose items that are about teaching a scale. And then, I, and then I evaluate people based on how well they separate these things out and are consistent in terms of doing that instead of um, the other. And so here's an expert and then here's a novice. And you can see that the expert you know, sort of does a nice job of separating it out and creating a scale, whereas the novice doesn't. And you know, where we sit with our research is to try and figure out whether this is true and real and positive and, and what the implications are for learning. So I recognize it's now 9.10, so is, are we meant to finish at 9, or are we, uh, we have to finish. Yeah.
Yeah, yeah the room till ten. Okay, so the um, so the so I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there just in terms of the the presentation part of it, but uh, happy to happy to take questions in the in the meantime. You know, for a guy who takes perverse pleasure in bad mouthing psychometrician, <laughs> you sure do a hell of a lot of psychometrician. <laughs> yeah, sort of right. hanging on to the cliff, yeah, trying to keep up with you. <laughs> Martin, as always, you really push my thinking. The last little bit, I just want to make sure I understand the sequence of your logic and a couple of assumptions there. If you can build up a series of cases that you can then show these curves by expertise versus novice, will you then assume that all novices by just generation of where they are in training should get this tailored type of intervention or should you run them through so you could actually see where their discrimination is and then from that build out their educational intervention? Okay. The, the images there, the, um, the, thing, the thing that we would imagine is that a person walks up to a, to a computer and, um, and starts doing cases. And, um, and in general, that would be kind of naive because it would, it, what it may well do is say, geez, you're not very good at this, you're a total novice, you have to do your, your vocabulary. And so it would go through an anatomy thing and it would teach that medical student what a Salter Harris 1 fracture was and that kind of stuff. But it would rapidly and as often as possible get you doing cases and get you doing cases that are that are um, that are in a progress testing kind of fashion. Sometimes they're way too hard for you, but but the majority of the time they're kind of set up so that you're you're succeeding, and um, and it just gradually has this sense of who you are and it grad and it has its own representation of what the environment is and what kind of cognitive model I'm trying to induce in you. And then, um, and then just plugs a way to fill in that model. And so, so where we failed is, and I told Matt about this, when you know, kind of, we download a bunch of EKGs and we sample the EKGs and then we just threw them at them, you know, sort of in, in the in the sense of not doing very much structuring and instead, you know, sort of being true to the task. But the task that you do is phenomenal, right? In the sense of it could be it could be any of 120 different diagnoses. And and the um, and and that's impossible to teach like that. And so that we had to strip it down to pericarditis versus stemmy, teach that, and then move on to the next thing. So to answer your question, and then what we're trying to do is 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 draw from you only stuff that's relevant to the cognitive model that I'm trying to trying to install in your head. And um, and then, but but anything that's related to that cognitive model, your fluidity, your certainty, your skipping views, your history reviewing, any of that kind of stuff is fair game within the thing. But stuff like I am a medical student, I am a nurse, I am the world's greatest cardiology, I say so, you know, kind of uh, kind of stuff gets thrown out because it doesn't have any predictive power compared to this stuff here. I think the cool stuff too that comes out of it. So, like obviously, ultimately, yeah, like an adaptive learning system that's really yeah. tailored. Like, but what we don't really understand is like actually what are the levels? Like we think, you know, we have what we teach in the classroom, but what we think are like what are the concepts that are fundamental to the next thing. But I'm not sure we got that right. That's what we're finding is like, oh, you think it just builds from like first you do normal versus abnormal, then I don't know. Let's dive into like the next difficult concept is. ST elevation, let's say, or whatever. And so you think that that's the way it goes, but what we find as we throw the sets at is that I'm not sure we actually, like if you look at the evidence, I'm not sure we understand what those, like if you thought of them as the levels in the game are, what are the natural levels in the game? Because clearly what happens with the med students when we just throw everything at it is they get better at normal versus abnormal, but that's it. So they're really they're learning to recognize normal as step one. You know? And what's step two within abnormal? I'm not sure we know. Does your adaptive learning machine, um, is it just on around binary um, diagnoses? Is, can you layer, is there a potential layer in that complexity? We've wrestled with interpreting ECG, and then we realized, oh my god, that's so many diagnostic tasks in one frame that we probably need to get back to what you're talking about straight away. Um, in normal and abnormal is even hard for us to define. 
Yeah, so the, the uh, exactly, but the but that that's where the hope is of this continuous scale, right? And so that, so that what the continuous scale gives you is you're no longer dependent on one item, and the um and instead each item is contributing to giving a sense of their overall ability to classify these things, and um and so that uh, so that how you teach that one item is important in terms of the granularity of how it goes across. But the um, but the but the you know sort of it's um, it, you're no longer representing the world as this is definitely a pericarditis. Instead, you're representing the world as um, 36 of your colleagues did this did this um, did this thing, and based on that information, we think you would 30% of the time call this a pericarditis, and 70% of the time call it an MI. And so the um, so that those those curves have done this in in pathology with um, with the Gleason scale in, in prostate cancer type of thing, which again is a continuous thing. And again, they make dichotomous decisions: chemotherapy, not chemotherapy, kind of kind of thing across that. And the um, and the gist of it is is that the that the pathologists, you know, the best of the pathologists have really really nicely separated. Um, there are five categories. Their, their curves aren't like this, they're like this. And so that uh, with very, very little overlap from a Gleason 2 to a Gleason 3. And so a patient looking that, at that would think, great. We, as um, you know, sort of interpreting, interpreting those middle category pericarditis versus demi things, we have a hard time with that. And so the, the, the best of our cardiologists, there are a number of them there, we said it's one or the other. And the right answer is, it could be either, I don't know based on the expertise of the cardiologist. And so that so I kind of naively went to the I'm on the I'm on the, the pediatric emergency medicine subboard of the of the American Board of Pediatrics. Yes Rose, we have an exam and, and you know, a whole lot of stuff special. <laughs> yeah. and, the, um, and so, I, so I bring them the, an ECG and I bring them a multiple choice stem and I say, you know, kind of here's an ECG and I have empiric evidence that this, the answer to this ECG is either pericarditis or stem. <laughs> I can't tell. And so answer C was, I don't know. Like, you know, sorry, and it's the right answer. And so, as you can imagine, it did not appear on the exam, and I was roundly booed and shooed out of the room in terms, <laughs> in terms, of, the, in terms of the thing, because we're not ready for that. That's not the way we think about multiple choice questions. And instead, you know, with the, the script concordance kind of thing starts to get at it, but the idea of representing uncertainty, uh, un uncertainty and fallibility is, um, is, is what we're hoping to do with this, but we're early, early stage. I guess the other piece that's not there too, you didn't put up the heat maps, but right. the other cool thing in the data is actually having these maps to say when they go at it and do it, what do they say when they say a different diagnosis. So within the individual or within the level of learner if you're the teacher, you can start looking and say when they get STEMI wrong, I can actually map out what are the diagnoses that they're confusing it with, so maybe I should be targeting their teaching to those mm -hmm. elements that they're confusing for either the individual or the class. That's really cool. Yeah. But is it worth looking at the items that do confuse the experts? Yeah, it's looking at all the items, basically. Yeah, but, you know, where, so where the item is, it's, an, it's a STEMI or it's a pericardite, and it's 50-50. What is it Yes, about those that? are the most what, interesting. What is it about that? And what could you learn from that in teaching somebody? Correct. Because if it's, if it's that, I mean, your point, of course, things are never that long, they're, they're sort of that. Uh, Hexagonal all the time. You know, it could be one of six things, you know what I mean? But if it is that kind of thing, what is it that's driving people one way or another? Right. And in that, in, in that um, study, that I just wanted the other bit, which Martin just barely showed, but there's the category where we actually went to the clinical data to find out like, what is the right answer. And the ones that were uncertain, some of them should have been uncertain. In fact, that person who was like, probably pericarditis was actually the only right person based on what the case had actually been that that ECG was derived from, because they're all in contextual in this teaching set. And I think there's some limit to what visual information can be. Correct. Expression. Yeah, that's not the end of the Even the clinical benchmark may not actually be the gold standard. Correct. Well, that, maybe, that was amazing was when you know, Sir Rose had one of her fellows go through each of these cases and establish the gold standard. So, that, uh, so this is on chart review what it played out to be. Yeah. So and look at are, ER, right? That one in the green, no come yeah. down, to pericarditis in the green, and then go across. Right. Because you were pointing at that person in pink. Yeah. But actually that person in pink was the one person who was 
was, you know, right, if you will, but right. Right. what actually right. happened in the case. So the right. three, the column that says three greater diagnosis was? That was three people reading it and giving their, so that's their normal like faculty or three, yeah, because that's what, you know, typically in our studies, that's how we'd say was the right answer, but then we took right. it one more step and had a rough fellow go back and chart review based on the math and the clinical info to say actually what was the clinical diagnosis for that patient. Mm -hmm. So that 50-50 that sometimes is super interesting because it probably, I'm not sure there is a right, like I'm not, it really is 50-50 maybe because From the medical, medical case, case point of view, it's worth teaching, it's still worth taking in history. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and maybe it's, it's less about uncertainty because that it's sort of an individual psychological construct and, and more just limitation of what is possible yes, to derive. Right, right, right. Because right. what do you need right. to do next? Is Correct. Say, right? there, is, there, there is inherent ambiguity and complexity mm -hmm. in some of this material that can't be teased out with a deterministic endpoint. Right? Right. And how this model then scales across scope, I think, is going to be the tremendous challenge. Right. Right? Because it's easy to find sentinel areas where they, we can nicely polarize the decision making. Right. Well, well, this only works if it's a unidimensional scale, yes. right? And so, the, so this 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 little bit of um, of pericardial and STEMI is unidimensional, and so that uh, so that that works. Uh, but but as soon as we start to layer stuff onto it, you know, I think I told you about our 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 hilarious. Um, factor analysis in which we had a hundred people do a hundred EKGs and there were 32 factors that, 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 that had an eigenvalue greater than one. So that, um, really? So well, that, I mean, there's 500 recognized appropriate uh, descriptions to affix to an ECG based on American College of Oh, yes, that handbook, right? That is itemized out there's a correct terminology and you must apply it. <laughs> <laughs> Lovers so, versus splitters, right? <laughs>